An incredible time this weekend at our men's retreat. There's something very special about just circling up and as men being able to talk about, address our fears head on and to pray for one another and then to, to be charged to come back and to, to lead our families and in our workplace and in our community and to just take hold of all that God has for us in a day and a time uh, where, where our society is screaming for this truth, and that is the need for godly men to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to overcome fears. Amen? So it's an incredible time. Uh, really look forward to those men coming back and uh, being charged this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Finding God in the messiness of life. We've been walking through the Psalms. The Psalms are poetry, different spots, points in life. When uh, life gets messy, and it certainly does, when it's filled with obstacles that stand in our way, the question always becomes, where is God? Can we find God? Is he near? Is he available? Uh, last week we began, and, and this week and then next week we will finish in three parts of Psalms. There are 13 in total that detail a particular point in David's life. Last week, David was in a cave because he was hiding. He was the innocent, anointed king, the coming king, and he was suffering. This week we will find that David sins further than he ever imagined possible. Can God be found in a situation like this, where your sin is so grotesque, you don't even want to look at it. You don't even want to think about it. That is the context in which David writes this psalm. In fact, I'm going, to be, I'm going to spend the majority of the sermon walking through 1 Samuel 11 and 12 and giving you the details in the narration. David writes Psalm 51 after he's been confronted by Nathan and he gets relief, he gets forgiven, and he unfolds what it's like to have that forgiveness on the other side. So if you would, in honor of God's word, would you stand as I read Psalm 51? Psalm 51. I'm going to be reading out of the New American Standard. (coughs) That version will also be on the screen. The subtitle, Psalm 51, for uh, for the choir director, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had had relations with Bathsheba. Verse one, be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me against you. You only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in my innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. and Do not hide your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice. Otherwise I would give it. 
You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you do not despise. By your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices. In burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, the young bulls will be offered on your altar. You may be seated. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you this morning and we open your word. We have sung your praises and now we pause to pray to you, God, to draw near to you, asking for your Holy Spirit to do a work in us that only you can do. Father, to know you is to deal with our sins is to deal with the gulf, the chasm that sin causes between a holy God and sinful man. Only by the blood of Jesus Christ. May that truth reign this morning. May the forgiveness that you offer by sending your son May that truth radiate in our hearts and break bonds and set the captive free. Oh God, that we would get serious about our sin. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. So we last left David in a cave. The innocent anointed king who is unjustly persecuted simply because he was God's chosen one and filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, he is foreshadowing the coming Messiah, the long awaited Jesus and how Jesus would be persecuted. But lest you think that David is perfect, lest you think that he is the long awaited savior Think again, because the Bible never hesitates to show that even the best of mankind falls utterly, utterly short of the glory of God. I give us a warning before we listen to this text that we are not to listen thinking and shaking our heads as if David is way over there and we're over here. Now, we certainly should shake our heads at the horrific sins of David, but simultaneously know that if a man after God's own heart could fall in such a way, if the great poet of the Bible could, be, could succumb to such great pride and deceit, then let him who stands firm be careful that we do not fall. David has now been king in Israel for about 20 years. He has united Israel. He has defeated every enemy. The economy is booming. Prosperity and God's blessings abound. Jerusalem has been established as the new capital. David's city. And God has promised that David's son will build for him a temple. But the promises go even deeper still, even grander, because David has been promised an eternal kingdom. That there is coming an eternal king with an eternal kingdom that will come from his line. David is not only a fierce leader, he's also kind as you walk through 2 Samuel, you actually realize that he reaches out to Jonathan's descendant and brings into the king's palace Mephibosheth, who's been crippled. But out of love for Jonathan, he brings him and allows him a seat at his dinner table. Reading your Bible, you begin to say, ah, finally, Finally, Israel is going to get it. Finally, they are going to be the shining city on a hill. Finally, they have a king after God's own heart. 
And then with the suddenness of a heart attack, David commits a a series of the most heinous sins in all of Scripture. 2 Samuel chapter 11. When the kings go out to battle and finish their war with Ammon, David decides not to go. I mean, he's about 50 now. His bones creak a little bit. He's not quite as young and spry as he used to be. This victory is going to be easy. I mean, they've had victory upon victory. He's not really needed. He's already known as a fierce leader out front who's, who's willing and able to get right into the thick of it. I mean, at this point, David deserves a little rest. Guys, he's earned it. But there's a fine line between rest turning into entitlement. There's a fine line between enjoying the fruit of your labor and overindulging. Prosperity brings an entirely different set of temptations. In the cave, we are tempted to say, no one cares for my soul. But on the mountaintop, we're tempted to read our own press clippings to believe the hype, to pridefully think we deserve. And all the while, God has forgotten. You see, the beauty of the cave is you cling, you plead for God's nearness. But on the mountaintop with so much neat stuff, we don't notice that we've left God's very presence. Not all enemies are external. If Satan can't beat you by attacking you from without, how about enticing you to pamper your flesh from within? David wakes up from a midday nap and walks upon his rooftop, gets to the edge and sees a woman bathing. Both of these are common activities. And at this point, he hasn't sinned. If you want to charge Bathsheba with something, it would be that she should have known uh, where the king's palace was. It was higher, uh, and she should have certainly been more modest. But when you read the text, it simply focuses on David. And she has his attention. He asked his closest servant about her as he keeps staring. She is Bathsheba, he warns. Her grandfather is Athiphophel, one of David's most trusted counselors. Her father, Iliam, one of David's mighty men. Have you heard of David's mighty men? That he had three, and then he had 30. And these 30, these mighty men, they're like Navy SEALs, special operatives, specifically the best of the best who go on trained missions for the king, always protecting the king, always about the king's business. Her father is one of those mighty men. And on top of that, Uriah, her husband, is also one of David's mighty men. The 30, and probably even a part of a more elite circle. But I suspect David already knew all of that. How many father and son-in-law duos could you have at your closest, most inter-ring circle and not know anything about it? (laughs) Rather, I've imagined that he has seen Bathsheba, exchanged glances across the room, possibly their eyes locked and lingered for longer than they should have. Bring her to me. David, don't do it. Don't do it. Take time to cool off. You have have a number of wives. The Holy Spirit begins to sound the warning bell. Warning, warning, warning. Don't do it. 
You see, the Bible promises to give us ways of escape. But David doesn't care. See, at this moment, he is his own God. And his own passions will determine what he wants to do and what he will do. One night of passion that will haunt him for the rest of his life. But everything was perfect. How could you? Why would you? Don't you understand the consequences and everything that's about to fall? See, the innocence of this situation shows us the utter sinfulness of man. It wasn't his circumstances. There is no one else to blame. It's simply sin. I know that sounds archaic to say in our day. Our society prioritizes circumstance environmental causes at the direct cost of personal responsibility. A five-year-old falls down throwing a fit and he's tired. He's hungry. He's had, he's had too much red food coloring. Just once I would like to hear a parent say, he's a sinner. The reality is, is we've believed a lie. We've believed a lie that if you create a perfect environment, that you will create perfect people. But you can't give enough love and positive self-esteem to create perfect people. Reread your Bible. Psalm 51 here. Verse five, I was wrought in sin from my mother's womb. So four weeks later, Bathsheba sends word she's pregnant. And here we go. A snowball of sin. Pause for a moment. What should David do? Repent. Stop digging. Don't go down the road you are about to go. It's only going to get exponentially worse. But all he can think about is what will they say? What will they say? How could I look at her grandfather in the eyes again? Her father. Her husband, the people who are the most loyal to me, the ones who lay down their lives for me. How could I even look at them again? And suddenly he begins scheming. Cover up upon cover up. So he schemes. As he's backed into this corner, he becomes a scrappy soldier who comes out swinging And scheming. And he has Uriah come home and he hopes that she might, that he might spend some time with his wife. And Uriah comes home off the battlefield and comes and sees David. And David exchanges all the pleasantries, just pretends like he brought one of his mighty men off the battle just to hear an account. Hey, how are things going? Well, Uriah is a man of impeccable integrity. And so David sends him home, but Uriah sleeps right outside of his door. Because he says, my my men, my brothers, they're on battle. They're risking their lives for our nation. We're fighting for God's cause. I, I can't go home and have pleasure with my wife. And so the next night, David tries and gets him drunk. Same thing. So instead, now David thinks he has no other recourse And sends Uriah away with the inscription, which is actually his own death. He gives the orders to have Uriah killed in battle and make it look just like a a casualty of war. And Joab complies. He knowingly sends Uriah's unit way too close to the city wall where the archers will come and fire down. 
And a whole unit is destroyed along with Uriah. Let's say a minimum of 50 soldiers. Each of them someone's husband, father, son. As families are torn apart. Surely given Uriah's high stature, who his father-in-law, grandfather-in-law are, as a mighty man, that he's given a special memorial service, which David has to show up and preside over and give special words that ring hollow as he looks at Bathsheba sees the devastation that his sin has caused. She weeps for her brave, kind love. Weeks later, when Bathsheba has completed her time of mourning, David takes her as his own. A snowball of sin and lies and deception to those who were most loyal to him. As if when the child is born five or six months later, uh, you know, good competent adults won't be able to count to nine. It will actually be between a year or two years later from that very fateful evening of the walk until Nathan will come and confront David. Now, it may look like from the outside that that David has won the cover-up, that he is now enjoying his beautiful bride, that he's living a carefree life, but nothing could be further from the truth. For he's actually locked inside his own prison. Listen to Psalm 32. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. He's having physical reactions for the the deep remorse and shame of sin that is weighing on him. His mind cannot erase the horror of what he's done. When she smiles at him, he knows it's hollow. All he can see is her frozen face at the funeral. His nightmares consist of him imagining what Uriah's final moments look like. It's the last thing he thinks about before he goes to bed and the first thing he thinks about when he wakes up, all in hopes of, tell me this is just a bad dream. Tell me it just can just all go away. But it can't. Food has no taste, music, no joy, nature, no beauty. My sins are ever before me. Psalm 51, 3. Verse 8, I have no joy. There is no gladness. I feel like my bones are broken. I would rather they be broken. You know what's worst of all, of everything I've said? Where can David turn? Where can he turn? He does not think he can turn to his God, the lover of his soul, his shepherd, the one who, 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 that he turned to time and time and time again, the only one who has always been there, always been for him. He does not think he can turn there. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me against you. You only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. 
Now, given the number of people that David has crossed here, I think it would do us some good to pause and to say, against God only you've sinned? I mean, we could start with Uriah. This statement is hyperbole, which is meant to make a point by an extreme example or extreme statement. So just like when Jesus says, you cannot follow me unless you hate your father and mother in comparison to your love for me. Obviously, we're not called to hate our parents. The scripture says, honor them. But in comparison, that your love and obedience and willingness to follow Jesus, your love for your parents, the gap needs to be so, it looks like hate. So here, has Uriah been sinned against? Yes, that's obvious. But all sin is first and foremost against God. And so much so, it's as if he is the only offended party. Have you ever thought in these categories? For God knit Uriah in his mother's womb. God is the one who gave Uriah courage to be such a skilled soldier. It was God who gave him the gift of a beautiful wife. God is Bathsheba's father. He made her beautiful for her husband. Who is David to destroy God's creation, to steal God's daughter, to deceive God's people? Every family that's destroyed, they're God's. Every person that David has been called to lead in the nation, God's. All that David has is a gift from God. It's God's throne, God's riches, even God's food. Even David's own body has been made in the image of God. God is the one who has given him immense worth and value as his very own creation. You see, God owns it all. Everything is from him and through him and to him. And every sin, every single one is an attack on God's character. You must think in these categories. To lie or to, to steal or to commit adultery isn't a sin because God sat down and said, look, I'm going to come up with a list of things that are sins. And I guess I have to agree to stop doing these things also if they're going to be sins. No. God doesn't lie because, well, how could he? It's not his character. It's not who he is. All sin is abhorrent to God's very own character. There are no small lies, no small amounts of theft, no victimless lust. It's all repulsive in light of who he is. Woe is me. For I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. His ways are not my ways and my thoughts are not his thoughts. He is a consuming fire who dwells in unapproachable light. And how could I ever think that I can approach him? And David knows he deserves to die. I mean, if just chapters before Uzzah touches the ark because an oxen stumbles and God finds it irreverent and strikes him dead on the spot, I mean, how much more so does David deserve to die? And so there David sits, locked inside his own prison. You see, he sinned further 
than he ever imagined that he could. And it can't be undone. And now the secret has become too big. The weight of it too heavy. That he simply doesn't even have the strength to repent. He doesn't know what to do. And here's the question. Can he find God in the midst of this? Suddenly there's a knock at the door. Nathan the prophet has come. And as he walks in, he immediately begins to tell a story. This is one of the most gracious acts in the whole of Scripture. As David, or as Nathan confronts King David about his sin. In the end, the summary is Nathan says, God knows. And I know. And David crumbles. No more hiding. No more covering up. I've sinned. He's longed to say those words. But he simply didn't even know how. But inside of his heart is genuine sorrow. Repentance, an agreement with God's standard. And he knew what he deserved. And the words that would follow that come from Nathan are the surprise of grace, a splash of cold water, refreshing. He says, you shall not die. But wait, how? Why? God's holiness demands justice. How can you say that that David shall not die? Well, as Romans 3 makes clear, all forgiveness, even in the Old Testament, is seen through the lens of Jesus Christ. That there is no forgiveness outside of Jesus because sin must be punished. Justice must be upheld. That only through the cross of Christ is man ever forgiven, is he ever made right. And so in this moment, Nathan can say to David, you shall not die simply because there is a coming one who will die in his place. And that night... For the first time in more than a year, David sits and writes a new psalm, Psalm 51, because his heart has finally been set free. Be gracious to me, O God, because of your love, wash me, cleanse me from my sin, for it is ever before me, but you, you, and only you, you can make me white as snow. Restore to me the joy of my salvation, the joy of your presence, of of knowing you, of walking with you, so that I may be able to tell others about your goodness. My sacrifice will be my praise. My sacrifice will be telling others about your goodness, the freedom, the forgiveness that you offer that is all found in you. Have you ever sinned further than you thought possible? Felt guilt so deep that your bones hurt. It couldn't be undone. You'd never look at life the same. I have. I was a young man in college. Sinned further than I ever thought possible. Friend, I was filled with so much guilt, so much shame. I just knew I had out the grace of God in my life. I was paranoid, waiting for the wrath of God. For days, 
I literally sat and waited because I knew what I deserved. I knew that I deserved his wrath to come upon me. And I was filled with fear. Filled with fear for three days. And after three days, I couldn't stand it anymore. And so I got to this moment where I crawled back into my prayer closet with, with complete fear and trepidation and whispered, God, when's it going to come? When are you going to pour out your wrath upon me? There's been a handful of times in my life that I have heard God respond. I, I don't mean audibly, but I do know with 100% certainty that the creator of the universe has an ability to speak to us with clarity so that we can hear him. And when I crawled into that prayer closet and when I whispered, when are you going to pour out your wrath upon me? He replied, you know what he said? Jason, if I have to pour out my wrath upon you in order to forgive you, it means that Jesus didn't pay for it all. As I sat there and began to process this truth, because I knew that well, what I would say about the cross, and I knew Jesus did pay for it all, that suddenly, as my mind began to process, my soul began to awake, and there was this freedom. There was this joy. There was this restoration of my salvation, this hallelujah that erupted from the depths of my soul, knowing that Jesus did pay for it all that I had been set free, not because I deserved it, not even a little bit, but all because of him and his grace. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sin. Friend, finding God in the messiness of life, the messiness of your sin, is not to take your sin lightly, but rather it's to understand that the greatest gift in the history of the world is that all of your sin was nailed to the cross and you bear it no more. Will you pray with me? King Jesus, we kneel before your throne. We confess how how little we think of our sin and that it is a kindness, a work of your Holy Spirit to see deeper, to understand more the depth of our sin and the need for forgiveness that is found only in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And then for us to overflow in the joy of salvation. Jesus, if there is anyone here that does not know you, has never placed their faith in you, would they hear your voice with clarity? Would they hear you calling them? They may not know, they may not think that they have the strength to say, I have sinned, but would you do that right now? Would your spirit confront them would they fall on their knees and would they cry out and give them mercy? And for all of us that do know you, may we never lose the joy of our salvation. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.